Um, there's the other one going, um, just through the bushes. I don't think... Is he? Okay, then let me just park the other way. Um, I don't think there's a kill right now. I think that they've actually just heard the rest of the, of the pride calling and that's why they've decided to move. But I don't think that the rest of the pride has actually got a kill or anything else for the time being. Still coming that way. Sorry, must I... A bit of a tricky one. Okay, I think maybe your best bet is to go into the fire break and wait for them there. <laughs> All right, I think that's where he's going. Let me just try and reposition and go forward so he can get a better view. All righty. So we're heading straight to Hyena Road, as you said. Let's see. We're gonna try and catch up with these lions who I can still see on the other side, but while we do that, let's go over to Tristan for an update. Well, if they go to Hyena Road, maybe they'll bump into that hippo and that might be quite exciting, so we'll have to see how that all plays out. But we are just cruising around. I was going to go try to see if I can find Hosanna, but he's gone into Torchwood, so we're not gonna be able to go and do anything there, and so that's ruined that plan. And then we also, this morning had tracks for a leopard that I wasn't sure if they were fresh or not coming back out of Buffalo's Hook and then into Juma and then kind of going in a westy direction now I thought maybe they were from last night but it must turn out to be Hukumuri's tracks coming back into Juma because he's just been found right close to the edge of Juma on the Simambili side on a kudu kill so our boy gets around and he moves around quite a bit so he's not going to be around at least for the next two days which is means that hopefully Tingan will catch a break the thing is though is that I haven't found a single track for Tingana anywhere coming south from Buffalzook Dam. I did Nyala Road, I did all the way along the Mulawati, down to Triyas, I mean to Twin Dams and no sign of any Tingana tracks coming that way. So he either went back into Torchwood or he went into Buffalzook, but he certainly hasn't come south that I can see. So I don't know quite where Tingana has gone, but hopefully he'll get some respite from this intruding male over the course of the next couple of days while he finishes off his uh, kudu carcass but what i did get a report of that maybe might be something to look forward to is we apparently there's tracks for dogs coming into juma but it sounds, it sounds like, like very close to the gate so i'm going to try and see if i can get up in that direction it, chances are they probably have gone into manuleti and i'm going to have another track disappearing but we'll try we'll see what we can get and maybe we get lucky and there is a wild dog fiesta happening around the top part of Juma. Now, while I bumble around here on Juma, I believe James is also bumbling around, except he's bumbling around in a forest of some sort in the Masai Mara, and I'm sure it must be absolutely beautiful to be inside that forest. I am bumbling in the most wonderful forested area. It's obviously the riverine forest on the banks of the great Mara River. And we're just doing a little sort of exploring. I've never been down here. The bird song is completely distinct from that that's on the grasslands. You can hear robin chats calling. I can hear the odd, what was it? There was boo-boos going, hoopoos. Sounds like a brew brew going prrrr. And the ubiquitous dove, of course, and we're looking at elephants, more elephants, enjoying, interestingly, the grass. Now, first lady, you're wondering about fruit that elephants can eat in the Mara, and if we get any that they do eat, I'm sure there is some. I don't know a huge amount of fruit out here. They'll definitely eat the Baronites fruit or the, <clears throat> what are they? I don't know what the common name is out here. Baronites aegyptia, they've got a fruit that the elephants will eat. I imagine that they will eat figs as well when they can from the fig trees here. Uh, other than that, there's no fruit like the marulas though out here that they will basically 
give up, ev forsake everything else for. Just isn't this the most rem remarkable atmosphere compared with how it was on the grasslands? And it's funny, you know, although birding in a forest in theory should be better than that than it is on a savanna or grassland area, you'll find that because the canopy is so thick above us, it's actually quite difficult to see and identify all of the birds that are calling all around us. Let's continue. I was hoping to find a leopard popping its head through the undergrowth, but I haven't found that. Oh, we didn't hear an antelope alarming, we heard a, a baboon calling. It was just a call, I think they were shouting at each other in a little troop of olive baboons. In my opinion, the best looking baboons there are. Right, I believe the lions are still moving and this time it's going to be for the last time. It certainly seems like it, James. They are moving straight onto the Bufalsuk area and we are not far from, from the boundary. So we are just on the fire break and it seems this boy has definitely heard the call of the rest of the Pride members or perhaps some of the boys because as we mentioned before it sounded like contact calls and they've just got up and carried on moving straight into that direction. Hmm. Even for somebody that's quite full they're walking with a lot of intent. And they keep, we've been steadily looking into that particular direction and walking all the way there. Now it seems like they will want to walk behind us. So I will just try to move again so that we can get a last view of them before they move out. Ooh, I don't even know where's the best way now. I've got both of them, so I'm gonna wait for them to cross and then go into the side, hopefully. Sorry guys, just stepping away from you. Okay, so he's, he's choosing the path that exactly the rest of the pride walked to get into Bufalsuk. There is actually a game path that they've been following, so I'm sure they've picked up the scent of a few different pride members and that's exactly where they're going. So just ahead of us, it's the entrance for the game path and that's exactly what he's going to follow to get in there. You see, he was Fleming grimacing just now, which I don't know if you saw him, it's almost like a snarl that they do. And he's sniffing the bushes, so he's, I'm sure, picking up the rest of the scent for one of his brothers and for the rest of the pride. Now, when they urinate or where they urine spray, there's a lot of olfactory communication that lingers in the air. And they have an organ in the top of their mouth called the Jacobson's organ, where they force all of these pheromones to go in. And then they identify who has been walking around, what's their status and so on. So you see, there he goes doing it again. I think I'm going to go slightly forward to get those branches out of the way. Sorry about that. And then he's coming. Also, just like his brother, using the same path that the rest of the pride has been using. Now, reports from the north uh, is that there is a large herd of buffalo around there, but it does. It seems like all of the buffalo are accounted for, and that actually no uh, lions have been found as of yet. So I'm sure these two are just going to go join up with the rest of the pride. Hi, boy. Just going to carry on onto the path and you see that's exactly where he's walking that's where his brother walked and probably where he's gonna go unfortunately we cannot drive or follow them any longer as they've crossed onto one of the properties in our northern boundary uh, and we wish them luck and we hope to see them soon hopefully they'll start chasing those buffaloes all the way south hmm well 
Seems like our lions have decided to disappear for the morning, so we're gonna let them carry on do their thing, hopefully reconnect with the rest of the pride, and we will send you guys back to James and a beautiful tower of giraffe. I'm sorry all lions have disappeared for the morning. We haven't found any lions, but I am not worried one jot. Here we have a Maasai giraffe. Now, if you were watching the TV shows with us of, was it, can it be only last week that we were doing them? It was only last week. In fact, it was on this very morning that we'd just finished our TV shows. And we played the game, <clears throat> Where Am I? And one of the days we asked you, where the different giraffe come from. We showed you a picture of a southern giraffe and then we asked you where it was and most of you got it right I seem to recall. They're not as obviously different, the southern giraffe and the Maasai giraffe, from say all of the giraffe species and the reticulated one. But they are distinct I suppose. They've got slightly less regular patches. Lovely colours, this one. Seems to be wanting his friends to come with him, but they have, well, they are coming very slowly. He's obviously some kind of a trailblazer. There are the rest of them coming now across the river. Well, they're not across the river, they're on the same side of the river. They're not great swimmers, giraffe, although we have seen them cross. Now, many of you often ask us when is the best time to come to Africa and of course Africa being as vast as Africa is uh, it's a really impossible question to answer but people ask to an area like this or to southern Africa where what time is the best time of the year to come and you know the tradition is to say well you need to try and time coming to the Maasai Mara during the migration if you're only ever going to come once then I suppose that's probably the right thing to do but I gotta tell you if you're ever going to come again, the amazingly private way you're able to enjoy this place at this time of the year is quite something. There are almost no, I mean there are one or two vehicles around, but very few. We haven't seen, I think we've seen one other until right now, and there are still hundreds of animals all over the place, birds galore, a landscape that is just utterly spectacular. So, you know, if the migration is not for you and the death and destruction that comes with it isn't something that sort of piques your interest and the peacefulness of a kind of epic African landscape is what you're after, this is an amazing time to be here. I've never been here this time. Let's have a look at these giraffes coming towards us. take some illegal photographs. Sarah, I don't know the answer to this. A giraffe born with teeth. I'm going to say yes, they probably are. They're probably born with small teeth. All mammals, as far as I'm aware, as far as I can find out from vets and a cursory glance at a couple of resources, are born with milk teeth. Not born with milk teeth, but have milk teeth. And I think you'll find that most of the grazers, which wean very quickly compared with, say, the predators or the primates, most of them will be born with their milk teeth. because they have to start eating their sort of gra the grass and vegetation very quickly. They're on solids almost immediately. It's just wonderf wonderfully ponderous movements. You know, where they're going? Why have they decided to go where they're going? No rush, hot so ever. Must be wonderful. birds singing next to us, the boo-boos. Trish, you say they're all males. Uh, I think we're looking at a female there. Are we? Yes, we are. I think we are. I think that's a female. That's a male on the left. If one on the right looked like it might be a female. 
Uh, like I said, I left my binoculars behind. Oh, yeah, there, that's a female. The one staring at the ground now. Window shopping. There is a consort, young male. Either her brother or a really hopeful fellow, covered in ox pickers. He'll be a bit young, I'd imagine, to dominate any mating opportunity. Maybe that's why he sort of lured her off towards the forest here, hoping for a bit of privacy from the prying eyes of big male giraffe. In fact, she's taller than him. I've had that problem myself on numerous occasions. Um, Lisa, I think I've heard your question correctly. Unfortunately, Rebecca's voice went fairly robotic there. She said, do males occur with the herds? Is that correct? Do they dominate herds or do they sort of live with each other on their own? I think that was the question. They don't live in herds. They will normally live on their own or in loose kind of bachelor aggregations. And sometimes they join up with herds. I'm not sure that we fully understand giraffe social structure particularly well. The females do occur in loosely associated herds, but I think you find because they see so very well, and also because they are able to communicate infrasonically, I think you'll find that although they, the herd might be quite spread out, it is in fact still a herd, so they can stay in contact without having to be right next to each other, like say an impala herd or a buffalo herd. And giraffe are finding something particularly interesting down at the river's edge and I'm not sure what it is. Perhaps they're doing a bit of birding. It is of course nearly the weekend and maybe they've taken the day off work today. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Here she comes. No, that's him. That's the shorty. We can call him James. Don, you want to know how they sleep? A fairly traditional method of sleeping, Don. They shut their eyes and read a bedtime story and then they pass out for a couple of hours. That's obviously a very facetious answer and I apologise profusely for it. Um, they actually sleep in a very interesting manner, Don. What they do, they can either sleep like that, standing up upright, a bit like a horse can, or what they do is they fold their legs up underneath them and then leave their heads up. Their heads have to stay up because if they don't, the pressure on the brain becomes too great. The heart is obviously very big because it's got to pump all the blood up sort of against gravity to the top and make sure the brain remains filled with blood and that means that if the head is not upright then the pressure on the brain becomes too great and eventually their brains will explode. I don't know if they'll actually explode but they'll certainly do themselves some damage and so they just fold their legs up underneath them and they sleep with their heads up. It's quite interesting to watch. What have you seen my friend? Hmm? Atomic orange? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say no. You say, do giraffe have knee problems? No, I don't think they do. I don't think any animals out here have particular problems with any of their joints because Unlike us, they live in the way that they have evolved to live, which means that they have got joints that are able to carry their mass. They don't overeat, and so you don't find an obese giraffe that is, puts undue strain on its hips and its knees. They do the exact amount of exercise that they're supposed to do for an animal that lives in an environment like this, which means that they keep their legs and joints moving the way, right way they, they're supposed to. They don't do silly things like run ultramarathons or equally silly things like sit on their backsides all day long, both of which humans engage in on a regular basis, sometimes both. And they also eat what they were supposed to eat, which means that they don't have build-up of various toxins in the body like we do. They don't have plaques and um, inflammation caused by plaques because they eat bad things and that means that their joints remain like they are. That said, I have no doubt that some of them get sore knees 
but you'll find very quickly that if an animal out here, especially something like a giraffe, is genetically predisposed to stiff knees or sore knees or sore joints, uh, you'll find they'll be taken out by lions very quickly and those genes that uh, were predisposing the animal to having bad joints would quickly be bred out of the population. And in human beings, we are becoming physically weaker as a species because of medical science. And so, you know, it doesn't really make a difference to our breeding success if we get arthritic very young or if we have diabetes, for example. We can still breed, which means the genes that uh, are coding or are uh, re responsible for dodgy knees and diabetes and that sort of thing perpetuate in the population, which they wouldn't out here. And so that's, you will find human beings with bad backs like mine or bad knees or bad hips, and that will just ca continue because it doesn't actually affect our ability as a s to survive as a species anymore. And that is all I have to say on that subject. Let's continue. Now I've just been asked to go back across to Ali so that we can she see what she has up for the rest of the morning. I don't know what that means, so I'm going to ask Ali to explain what she has up for the rest of the morning. Well, my plan for the rest of the morning is to try and see if we can find any signs of where Tingana might have gone yesterday evening because he was definitely not at the dam wall and we've gone and check around the spot where he where we left him yesterday lying on top of that bank of the dam but unfortunately it, there were no tracks and it seems like the buffalo eventually actually even got onto that bank so I'm pretty sure that either he left before they chased him or the buffalo might have been involved in chasing him so there are too many buffalo tracks in the area to actually be able to tell if you know one male leopard has moved across the area so we've come to one of the parallel roads that runs not too far from Bufuzuk Dam see if perhaps we can pick up anything around here as we know that Tingana has walked this area before and he tends to pretty much prefer this this path so we'll see there is a very big game path that leads from Bufuzuk Dam onto this road just a little bit further west so hopefully we'll be able to pick it up there or see if there's anything that's been going on down there so that's pretty much the plan for the afternoon that and any cool trees that we can see because trees are always welcome in my view but we shall see what we can find a little bit further down the road awesome. oh Impala hello have you guys seen a leopard by any chance hmm I'm pretty sure you guys were exactly the same boys that I thought were gonna get eaten last night by Tingana Hello, oh, well, good to see you survived another night and we shall carry on looking for our spotted friend Bye guys, you're still very young, so hopefully you'll have a long life. Alrighty. I'm just gonna keep on watching the road and just see if there are any tracks that we might be able to see down here. And it would be very nice to see Tingana again and just find out what he's been up to. But like I said, I, he walked quite a distance yesterday during the day, so I wouldn't be surprised if he also walked quite a lot during the night. Okay, those are not leopard tracks if he had walked during the night and I, as we saw with the lions it's still or it's starting to get a little bit warmer up so I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually already gone flat somewhere and he's just enjoying a cool breeze somewhere around these blocks but here's to hoping that maybe we will bump into it or perhaps Tristan will bump into him now not too much around here little spotted wood dove that flew away very quickly hmm. And I wonder, I wonder if perhaps Tingana is actually now feeling better and he's starting to head down towards the central parts of Juma to reclaim his territory from Hukumuri or another possibility is as well that he is still trying to avoid him and I think we've got a 50-50 chance him here and that he, from Bufalzuk Dam he went onto uh, Bufalzuk itself and that's why the tracks for Hukumuri mail go in that direction because yesterday when we bumped into him he had his nose straight on the ground and it almost seemed like he was trying to sniff any other leopards around so I wouldn't be surprised if 
right now, you know, it's it's almost like a chase between all of the leopards, see who's going to find whom first and who's going to have the advantage or the surprise advantage. For his sake, I hope that he does not meet any other male leopards, at least until he's had a very good meal. Alright. Seems like not too much here. I've also been asked to try and find some of the lucky beans. I haven't seen any, but hopefully we'll see some. No, don't run away, Kudu! There we go. Bye bye, Kudu. Female Kudu. Is it just you by yourself? It does seem like it's her by. Oh no, there's another one that's gonna come. Two. Another two. There are three. Aha, that are gonna come and cross the road just ahead of us. So nice to see Kudu sometimes. Oh, and what have you got on your eye? It's almost like a tear. Huh. See? Yeah, she's been crying, but, you know, really badly. Maybe she's she got dumped on Valentine's Day. We don't know. Um, no, it almost seems like she's got an injury in her eye, and there's been some crazy blood coming down from, from her eye. Hmm. You look fine, on the other hand. Now one more female coming through. It is amazing, just as they pop out into plain view, just, you see, you can see half of her body, and half of her other body you don't see that well. And it's amazing just how... A tawny color and a few stripes actually hide them properly from the rest of the creatures all around us. Hmm. Well, thank you, Kudu, for crossing the road. That was very kind of you. <laughs> now, let's see if our injured lady is here again so we can have another look at her eye. Uh, she is there, but she is behind too many trees. I'm not too sure how we're going to get another view. It's almost like something tried to get to her eye. And then that's why there's been a lot of blood going down. She still has an eye by the looks of it. But it seems like it's an older injury as well now. There you go. That must be quite painful. It is. Imagine just for us, if you, when you get something in your eye, if it's quite annoying, imagine having all that blood pouring out. Hmm. Incredible. Banada, you're wondering if animals see humans as other animals or if they see them as dominant. Well, in this particular area, I think it depends if we are on a vehicle or if we are walking. So a lot of the times, if we are walking, because they're not that used to seeing us around on foot, they consider us not really a dominant species, but more as a threat because they're not used to seeing us around. They don't know our intentions. They don't know where we come from. And even that's why we can get very close to certain animals on the car, but we cannot get that close to them on foot. Whereas I think that when we are on the car, they, some species, I have a feeling that they can recognize that there's a person in every seat. Like for example, the elephants, there's, elephants are very clever, but they, they're not to bother because there's been, you know, they see us as a thing that just comes there and it does different species, a different thing that does its own thing and doesn't really annoy them. But if you try to approach elephants on foot, then you've got to stick to a certain distance and respect, you know, whatever it is that they're doing and the environment and their safety areas just to try and not bother them whatsoever. So I think it depends on well definitely at night a pride of lions can definitely see us as not as a dominant species but as a good meal. Even leopards and hyenas. Hmm. There were some mongoose around here that we're calling but I cannot see them anymore. Seems like they've gone. Alright. We're going to carry on trying to find either a track for Tingana or perhaps anything else. But while we do that, let's go over to Tristan and find out what his plans are for the rest of the morning. Well, I think if anyone's got the luck this morning, it's Ali. So hopefully she will be able to find Tingana or at least an indication of where Tingana went and what he's been up to during the night. I'm, I'm hoping that he's sitting on a kill somewhere feeding away, getting nice and fat and healthy again. That's what I'm hoping for. But hopefully Ali, like I say, will find some indication of where he went. Now I'm up in the area where supposedly these wild dogs came to Juma, but I cannot find a single footprint. Although there's a squirrel alarm calling. Where are you squirrel? Now it stopped alarm calling. It was right here. The impalas look very relaxed. They don't look like they're too worried about anything. They're just on my left hand side having a little feed. Although I suppose the one looks quite serious, doesn't it? It looks as though it's very perked up. 
kind of watching us and just checking, making sure we're not sitting with a leopard. Don't worry, no, all the leopards have gone elsewhere today. They've decided they were going to go and tour around. They'll be back tomorrow, so don't worry. That's a face of somebody who doesn't care or understand what I'm saying, does it? Talking about things understanding. It's definitely Impala does not understand what I'm saying at all. Now, I will say that this Hukumuri male is an absolute sort of marathon runner. The amount of tracks I've found for that male this morning is short of staggering. He has done a serious amount of walking during last night and has gone on pretty much every road that we have on this whole western sector. I've found his tracks on Impala Plains, on Balanites Road, Rebecca's Road, Zoe's Road, then up Weaver's Nest, onto towards Inga's, Wahlberg's, down towards the dam, across onto Mvubu, Mvubu towards Gallego Shortcuts, Gallego Shortcut to Aubrey's, Aubrey's back to Buertela Access and then to the west, which is really a long way to go. So, been a busy boy last night and I must say I'm starting to think that he just likes Juma at night because he keeps appearing on the dam cam or around the camp at night and then the next morning he's all the way back in the west. So it'd be nice if he changed and shifted his schedule to the other way around. Quite happy for him to go visiting other places at night but it'd be nice if he stayed put for the mornings for us to find him and not just tease us with these tracks. Okay, wild dog tracks, here we go. Come on. So far, very little sign of wild dogs. There's lots of hyenas that have walked around, but very few wild dog tracks. We should be able to pick them up quite easily. Wild dogs generally make a nice mess of the road, given that there's so many of them. There's normally lots of little footprints all over the place. Of course, the tracks for the wild dogs could potentially not be wild dog tracks and could be tracks for hyenas. It has happened many times before, so we'll just have to check it out and see. Right, now, while I bumble along and try and find these wild dog tracks, my co-worker and friend who was here a few days ago is also doing the very same thing, and he's not looking for wild dog tracks, but for anything possible in the Mara. I am not finding any wild dog tracks on account of the fact that I think the only two wild dogs we've seen uh, in the Mara for the last goodness knows how long was actually in June last year. There were two seen around here. Brent Leo Smith did his best to find them, but unfortunately we were unsuccessful. Now we are heading, meandering slowly back towards the escarpment, into the realm of the Sausage Tree and Ololololololololo Prides. Oh, Michael! Now, you want to know why it is or how it is we know if animals can see in colour or not. Well, what you do, let me show you. Let me show you quickly how you do this. One, one moment, please. Let us look at the forest for one moment while I sort this out for Michael. That's why I've stopped, Rebecca. Rebecca says I'm not allowed to use my phone while I drive because it's promoting bad driving. All right, I'm almost there. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can find a slightly bigger one. Let's go to this one. Okay, Arch, if you can bring your camera to bear on the phone there. Right, so what you do is you hold up a number like this in front of the elephant and say, can you see the number five? If the elephant says, no, I cannot, then you know that it is colorblind. Now, obviously this is facetious, but the point of showing you this is to show you green and blue. Now, what we do know about animals, like uh, certainly the predators, is that they can see both of those colours. If you were able to find a lion that could... whoops, it's gone now. Sorry about that. If you were able to find a lion that could speak English or Swahili or any other language for that matter, that a human could understand, and you showed them that thing with green and blue, they would be able to see it. If you put a red number in the middle, they won't be able to see it. So they do not have the ability to see red. Now we know that from the kinds of cells they have in their eyes. 
and obviously I don't know an enormous amount of detail but Michael basically there are two kinds of cells there are rods and cones in your eyes the rods are photoreceptors they can see light and dark they pick up the contrast between light and dark we don't have a lot of those and there are cones that see color and there are different kinds of cones that see red green and blue and it depends on the concentration of those cones as to how good your color sight is and we know that most animals other than primates and birds have got a much lower concentration of cones than we do for example and they also in the case of the predators out here and I don't know what the case is with, with something like an elephant they don't have the red, uh, red cones they're unable to see red which means that, and the best way to illustrate this or to <coughs> make you understand it, I think, would be to show you something like an impala, which is a red color, walking through the greenery, which to you and I is completely obvious. But to something like a lion, I'm going to show you one more of these pictures here. You can actually test whether you are colorblind yourself. If you look at this one, I don't know if, Arch, can you see that at all? We'll just try and make it a little bit brighter. No, it's just reflecting, isn't it? How's that? Tilted down. Sorry about this, everybody. It's not great. But what that is, is red. Oh, there we go. It's red on green. Okay? And there's an, a number eight in the middle there that a lion or a leopard would be unable to see because it's red. Okay, and that's like an impala walking through some greenery. They are unable to see that colour. Okay, sorry about that. I mean, it's just a little bit awkward with the light behind this phone. So, I hope that answers your question. Now, I don't know how you tell the difference between these different cells in the eye. That is up to somebody who is uh, much more competent at physiology, for example, than I am. But some people can do that. You I'm assuming that there's some microscopic way of telling whether a, a particular kind of cone cell is a red, green or blue sea. Oh my goodness, Tristan seems to have had some luck. Whether it is dogs or cats, it will be exciting regardless. Well, it is not a dog, as you can see, because it is sitting in a tree ever so pretty as only a leopard could do. And so a very nice find for us. Actually, we just came around the corner and there sitting in the tree is this beautiful leopard. Now, I can't see nicely because the glare is really bad and I forgot my binoculars at home, naughty Tristan. But it looks like Shadulu female. I think it's her. Um, I would just want to check when she turns her face a little bit better towards us. But it looks like there's a five spots on the top right yes so i think it is shadulu female which is very very cool to see I, she's not far from where supposedly hukumuri is with his kill because hukumuri is inside simbambili apparently and we are actually well the tree is inside simbambili it's off the main road but it's being very very delightful for her to sit right here next to the road as close as she is so you can see there she's perched in this beautiful marula now i don't see any sign of food here and i wonder if maybe just maybe hukumuri didn't steal from her and that's pushed her kind of this way towards the edge of the boundary but either way it doesn't matter like i said it's such a nice thing to see and she really is a beautiful individual she's a big girl and i'm I think it's her, like I said, I mean, it looks very much like her with that five spot pattern with the one spot above the four spots on her right side. That's always a good way to work out whether it's her or not. And like I say, a stroke of luck because it's really on the boundary and if she comes down and walks 20 meters to the west, we're not going to be able to see her at all. So very, very cool and a, like I say, nice way to sort of finish off our drives hopefully she'll stay up the tree for the remainder of the drive and then maybe come down and come on to Juma this afternoon which would be very very special but awesome to see it's amazing how she's starting to kind of come more and more to our side it's, what interests me about this whole thing is that this is an area where Shadow used to spend time. When I first started at Wild Earth and when I spent a lot of time at Simomili, this is where we looked for Shadow. It was on this main road and either side of it she used to hang around going down towards Gary Main and to the gate. That was all Shadow's territory and she used to go up and down 
in this area, even with her cubs. She used to spend a lot of time with her cubs in this section. But since the sort of changes have taken place and, you know, she's had this current cub that she's got and she's kind of pushed a little bit further to the east with the with the disappearance of Karula and, and Tingana seemingly moving more east as well, you know, Shadow has kind of filled that void that Karula left on the western side of the Mulawati with Tandi being on the eastern side and then up into the central parts of Juma. Now with Hukumuri being around and the fact that Shadulu has mated with Hukumuri, I'm pretty sure we're seeing a situation where she's now pushing further into Juma because so is he. And at the end of the day, wherever he goes, she'll want to be in the core of his territory to make sure that now that she's mated with him, if she is pregnant, that she is able to keep that cub safe. And so that's why I think we're seeing more sightings of her is because Shadow has pushed further east and now she can allow herself to come further into Juma as well, which is very cool for us here yeah, because she is one of the most exquisite females and very big girl and a different genetic, which is very good as well. At the end of the day, we want lots of different genes around. It helps with the diversity of the area. Now, Lisa, you're wondering if she's got a kill in the tree. I can't see one, so no, I don't think so. I mean, I might be wrong. Maybe there is a kill stash somewhere in that tree. I can't see anything from where I am. Like I said, I didn't bring my binoculars. I was a bit naughty this morning. I forgot them on Rusty, and Ali took Rusty this morning, so I don't have my binoculars with me, but Senzo's doing a bit of scanning with the camera there, just to try and see if any of those forks house some legs dangling from them but it doesn't look like it it seems as though she's just lying up in the tree just for well comfort i suppose maybe it's because it's been a warm start to the day and it's just nice and comfortable to be up there the thing is is she's breathing quite heavy and it looks as though her tummy's fairly full so i wonder if maybe she didn't have a kill somewhere close by and like i say hukamuri apparently is on a kill on one-eyed pan road now if we come back to me sends i'll show you where we are in relation to this so there's a pathway here you see this big pathway that's running there now that pathway takes you straight to one-eyed pan which is a small little water point uh, much like a mud wallow and from there then the road kind of extends a little bit further but Hukumuri is somewhere close to that pan so straight along this little pathway which means that maybe he robbed that kill from Shadulu and she's now just come this way and is now resting so she fed a little bit she's hot she's full and there's a lot of flies around at the moment and so that's why she might have just gone up into the tree is to get away from the flies there'll be a bit of a breeze up there and just to be a little bit more comfortable and, and her kill itself might not be in the tree because like I say Hukumuri might have taken it from her it's difficult to say whether or not he did or didn't but at the end of the day she's lying here very relaxed and there's no sign of any carcass that we can see i will reposition just now and try and have a look like i said we're right on the edge of the of the road and so we have a situation where you know we can't go any further to the right of where she's lying but at least we've got a semi-decent view of her from here that's for sure i think so anyway but how cool is that it seems as though we've had a spectacular morning all round it's been a little frustrating for us for senzo and myself but ali's had a seemingly epic morning and james seems to be absolutely full of him his usual sarcasm and wit up in the mara so it seems as though it's been a good day and it's certainly a good feline friday when you've got lions and leopards on the same morning so dale you're wondering what the word shadulu means it means a termite mound so our two new leopards that we are seeing on juma are chicken medicine and termite mound it's very very you know serious names and you can see lots of thought went into both of them no i'm kidding so for me i mean shadulu has, has been many different leopards in the past in fact i think there's still one that is alive that is in the londolozi area and there's been a number of other shadulus that have been named that so it's not my favorite name for a leopard i feel like it's been used countless times and sometimes you know when you get a spectacular individual and and the shadulu female that was on londos who i think passed away recently she was kind of like the karula of londolozi for us here at juma and so naming another leopard shadulu doesn't really sit right for me but i wasn't you know involved in it and and certainly we didn't have a say in what went on and so that's why the name was given and now that it's been given there's not really much we can do about it so we're just going to have to swallow the pool but it means a termite mound and she was given the name because she's apparently always on termite mounds although a lot of the photos i see of her is more on trees and fallen over stumps than on mounds but i mean we have very little experience with her so i suppose we can't really grumble too much we just got to take what comes our way as for Hukumuri, well, like I say, we've been through his naming a few times. Now, what's that coming up the road there? It looks like a warthog's coming straight towards us here. Senzo, you see on the road? So there's something walking straight towards us. Is it a warthog? 
Yes, it is a warthog. So there's a warthog that's walking straight in this direction. Now, the warthog probably won't see her up on the tree. Now, don't go that way, warthog, because we're not going to be able to see you if you go that way. So the warthog is gone in, is going to go straight to where she is at this moment. So there we go, crossing, and she's up in the tree. Now, she hasn't seen the warthog yet, but she most certainly probably will at some point. If she just turns her face to the left-hand side, she'll have a view of it. The problem with it is that the warthogs are going deep into some mammalian, so if she tries to hunt them, we're not going to get much of a view at all. In fact, we'll probably lose her in about two seconds. So let's just see how this plays out. I'm hoping that the warthogs turn a little bit and start pushing more towards our side, and she actually notices them, because for now, she hasn't actually even seen them. She's busy kind of looking off into the distance down towards some melee kind of campsite, rather than actually at the warthogs, and now she's turning and almost looking at us. Should you do? To your left, girl. Down and to the left. No, no, apparently not. Maybe warthog's not on the menu. She almost looks as though she's in full relax mode and recline mode. She's not really interested in hunting warthogs just yet. Also, interestingly enough, is you very seldom see the females chasing warthogs of that size. They will go after small piglets, but warthogs of that size are generally left for the males. They can be very dangerous warthogs, and, and female leopards, for the most part, don't really tackle warthogs too often. They, there's too much danger involved in it, and so you find that they'll kind of watch them unless there's small piglets and then go. It obviously, it's not always the rule and you can never there we go she i think she's noticed them now you see how she's just turned her head all of a sudden she kind of just swiveled her head around but she hasn't changed or adjusted her position at all she's kind of got her legs still down if she was wanting to hunt those warthogs you would find that those legs would have come up onto the branch itself and she would have been positioned to then kind of just drop down and go into towards the to go towards the ground so you'd find legs up into onto this sort of branch now she's also watching another car that's just arriving so there's one of the vehicles from the west that is also got here and that's also maybe why she just moved her head but let's see what she gets up to for now she's just going to sit tight and take it easy Nope, it doesn't seem like she really wants to hunt those warthogs too much. Like I say, her whole demeanor and her body position would have changed completely. She's still in very much a relaxed situation. She's got her, like I say, her legs dangling, and she's not really paying too much attention. She's more watching the vehicle that's driving around her than anything else you can see there. That is a, a fully relaxed individual. It's not an individual that's prepping to hunt at all, I'm afraid. I thought maybe she would. It was kind of looked as though the warthogs were going to come in this direction, but... And maybe the warthogs have also cut a little bit further away and she's just not really that interested. Right, now, I'm not sure who exactly James is referring to, but apparently we need to send you to him because he has a feathered friend named George. To the right, there he is. There he is. George is a black-chested snake eagle. And the reason he's called George, well, I just made up his name. Rebecca said, quickly tell me what that bird's name is. So I said, his name's George. Because she wanted to help Tristan create some kind of narrative link to me, of course. What she meant was, what kind of bird is it? And it is a black-chested snake eagle. And the camera work being brought to bear by Archie is quite phenomenal right now. Isn't that amazing to watch it fly like that? It's so peaceful. Now you'll see it turn with the wind and it's going to zoot out of picture. No, it's not. It's turned back into the wind. How remarkable. If we do get the roof in the shot, I'm sorry about that. He is gaining height, is our black-chested snake eagly. Just hovering on the wind. They do hover more so than most raptors do, other than the black-shouldered kite, of course. And there, it's almost impossible. Once he turns to fly with the wind, he increases his speed by an order of magnitude. There he goes. This really is very special to watch. Now, some of you may be who are interested in birding. The 
confusion, or there is sometimes confusion between a martial eagle and a black-chested snake eagle. If you look next time he turns, you can see that this fellow has got white underwings. The marshal has got very dark chocolate brown underwings. He's also twice the size, but it's very difficult to see at this distance how big they are. And every single second that bird is making multiple micro adjustments to the shape of the wing to allow it to fly and remain sort of on the path that it wants to take. It's now miles away. It's gained about, well it was down here, it's gone up above the escarpment now, it's gained about 300 meters at least since we were last, since we first found it. Our alarm work, you're wondering if it's hunting. Yes, I imagine it probably is looking for black chested snakes to eat. <laughs> It'll be looking for reptiles and small mammals to eat. In fact, it's gone now twice the height of the Olololo escarpment, so it's, it's about 400 meters up. That's something like 1500 feet, and it's achieved that in the space of about five minutes. Most impressive. And a lot of the birds now are taking off as it starts to warm up a bit. Not that it was freezing this morning, but it was quite chilly and difficult for these big birds to fly. I'm most impressed that Tristan managed to find the leopard who has been romantically named Termite Mound. I'm not sure why it is that there are so many Termite Mound leopards in the world. Little Owl, you're wondering about what kind of lizards there are in the Mara. I am going to confess to not having much of an idea as to the lizard diversity. <clears throat> the most colourful one though is something called a... Oh, what is it? Come on now. I've lost my... It's got that beautiful pink and uh, purple head and it is called uh, an... Mwanza, that's it, there we go. It's called a Mwanza. It's like an Agama. It is a species of Agama. But there are lots of other different kinds of lizards and I'm afraid I will have to do a little bit of research on exactly which kinds there are here. Thank you, Lil Owl. Which I assume is a contraction of the word Little Owl. Now the wind is starting to come up, which is another reason that that bird took off. Or Lillian Owl, of course, yes, thank you, Rebecca. Right, we're going to go back across to Ali. I got a lot of robot voice there. I think she has something final to show you for this morning. Sure would hope so, but maybe it just means that we haven't found it yet. We didn't come across any tracks for Tingana or pretty much any other spotted creature and we've been going up and down all the roads trying to see if we can come up with anything else. But we actually haven't found many living creatures, so I think everyone's just taking it easy today. But very happy to know that Tristan managed to find a leopard because otherwise he would have been very sad. So woohoo! Two cats, and well, three cats technically speaking, but two different species in one morning. I think it was quite a successful day, quite a successful thing. And well, we still have the afternoon to go and look for all things. Now, if the weather carries on like this, there is a chance of creatures moving around a little bit more. So perhaps anyone that's left us might come back, or new characters will come back into our traverse where we can view them. Like I said, pretty much nothing around here. Oh, other than the beautiful, in, uh, not Impala, Niala. Now, if you were wondering about the different colors, so the males are the ones that are, were very dark and started running and dashed off to, to the bush, and then the females are the ones that have this beautiful reddish color. And I think of this area, they are probably my second favorite antelope, as they are so beautiful, and their tails are so fluffy and big and just gorgeous, and they always seem to be in such good health. Hmm. 
pretty with all your stripes. Now, if you remember the kudu that we saw earlier, they are closely related to the kudu and a dead giveaway are those stripes that they have on the sides. But also, for the males, they've got beautiful spiral twisting horns. So, spiral twisting horns are a characteristic of this particular family, which is called the Trigillafini family for the Nyala, the kudu and the bush bug. Now, a bit of a tough spot as they're all going behind the bushes so we're gonna carry on and see if perhaps we can find something else at Galago Pan. I'm still hoping for the tambo we didn't find yesterday <laughs> so hopefully he'll be there somewhere or something to give us an indication as to where he's gone off to. Hmm. Ooh. Alright, seems like the sleeping beauty that's keeping Tristan company has woken up. So let's go over to them and have a look. She has indeed. So she's up and looking. And the reason why she didn't hunt the warthogs is now very obvious. Because I've changed position slightly. And I have found why she's in this tree. is because she has a dead steenbok up in the tree. Which is on the far right. It's very difficult to see it. It's up there. Go. Is it not? To, maybe to the left a bit since? Have you got it there? Well, you can see somewhere there is a dead steenbok that's hanging in the branch. It's very difficult to see it. It's not easy at all. But since let me just move because she's moved and there's a really nice view of her. So I want to just quickly get a better view of what's going on, which should be straight through like that. There we go. Hello, girl. So she's kind of peering at us now through the bushes which is quite nice and at least you can see her face a little bit better but that's why she's in here is because she's got this carcass and so she'll be here for probably the most of the day there's not at the end of the day not very much left of it there's probably enough to go through for tonight and then she'll probably be out of here tomorrow the thing is is she's had this carcass for a little bit already so i'm not sure if she killed it on this side or if she killed it on our side i don't see any drag mark coming from our side over this way so I think it must have been killed this side and then dragged to this tree and put up into the tree. But she's definitely had that for more than a day. That meat is dark, it's dry, which means that there is some sort of sort of rotten has that has happened to it. And yesterday was a warm day, but I mean, it, at the end of the day, it probably was killed the night before last, which is good. It's crazy to think also that we've got a situation where we've got two leopards within almost 300 meters of each other, both on different kills. It's pretty cool to see now. Look at that, isn't that beautiful as she come down the tree? Now we've got to park where we are at the moment because of the sort of angle that we're at and hopefully she's going to come down. The good thing for us as well is that, oh yes, come lie there, that's it. Good girl. So she's hopefully going to lie exactly on that branch because that will be much better for us that's for sure let me go no she's going that way or are you going to come down girl are you tired of being in the tree she's a very pretty cat and she's a she's a nice size female as well which is very cool to see you know we often see tundi and shadow and they are beautiful girls but they are a little bit on the smaller side in terms of female leopards whereas shadulu is is a bulky character it comes from that same sort of lineage down in that southwestern corner most of the girls down there are a little bit bigger than what we see from this eastern lineage which is karula's kind of bloodline karula was not small but you know tandy shadow shungile shivinzi all of them were a bit more petite in size oh that is absolutely perfect. Thank you, Michael, for lying like that. She's decided that she's going to show off to all of you and just lie perfectly for us right in front of where we are. She's just not even, I would say, 10 meters from where I am now, just start lying kind of facing towards our direction, which is absolutely wonderful. So we're being spoilt this morning to finish up. And the good thing is that she should be here this afternoon as well. So we should have a nice afternoon with this girl. She should be kind of in the same tree i don't think she'll have gone too far at all i think she'll kind of maybe go and drink and it's going to like i say be interesting to see if she goes to one-eyed pan to drink or if she comes onto the juma side to drink because there's a nice little mud wallow not very far from here now alicia in our fc is asking um questions instead of rebecca so trying to throw me off but alicia i'm on to you don't worry now if you can just repeat the name for me, Alicia, because it also sounds awfully like your name that you just gave me for our question that we have. Ah, 
So, Vakisha, you're wondering how often Shadulu is seen in this area. Well, it's, to be honest, we've only had her live on drives, I think, three times on Juma itself. We did see her in, we used to see her on Arethusa a few times, but we haven't seen her very many times at all. Definitely under 10 times that we've had her on live drives. And so she's fairly new to this section. Um, and in terms of seeing her up as far as we're seeing her right now, then she is very, very new. I mean, it's only in the last kind of two weeks that she's been in this kind of area as far as we know. So it's really quite exciting to see the fact that she's kind of making her way in and starting to become a part of the scenery here. And I'm sure she's going to spend a lot more time on Juma as well, particularly because Shadow is not moving in this area at the moment. So there's a big vacant space for her to kind of use this northwestern corner. And it's a productive corner for leopards. It's always been a good spot for leopards. We've had a lot of leopards that move here because you've got Sydney's Dam. Then you've got a few mud wallows between Sydney's Dam and where we are. And then you've got one-eyed pan. So it's a nice little water chain that runs along here. Here, which attracts a lot of different animals and therefore attracts the predators and so we've had a lot of male leopard thoroughfare through here and even female leopards like i say in the form of shadow and karula used to spend a bit of time here as well so it's a good place to be but you can see she's kind of licking her chops and looking around it's amazing to me though with her she almost looks a lot older than she actually is she's a, she's still a young female she's only about four years old now so she's just coming into her first easter she's just mated for the first time she's never had cubs before and she looks a little bit kind of older in her face it's an interesting kind of phenomenon because if you look at you know tundi and shadow they're 11 years old and you compare their faces and their ears you'll see that there's a very similar sort of kind of aging pattern she's got quite tatty ears already for her age Unfortunately, though, it is that time of the day where we are going to be starting to head home. There's good prospects for this afternoon, so I hope that all of you will be joining us to try and see how Shadulu fares during the heat of the day, and then this evening maybe we'll get lucky and get some really cool stuff. But from all of us in the Mara and Juma, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we'll see you all this afternoon on the Sunset Safari.